There are so many crises and history changing world events at the moment and so many good and bad historical comparisons drawn from events. That's what I'm talking about on the Burning Archive podcast this week. Yes, it's a show, a practical, well, you could say practical, or at least a how-to show this week on the Burning Archive podcast. Every day, mindful history for the listener. How, when confronted with so many stories about the past in the media, in books, on television, on the internet, instant comparisons with well-known historical events and the most recent events, how do you kind of sort it out and decide what's true? This is an essential skill for independent thinking in a time of war, a time of crisis. I'm going to try to show you how to tell the difference between good and bad history for comparative purposes. You could also say between insightful and distorted history. But we'll get to that more later in the show. It's easier than you think. I'm Jeff Rich and this is the Burning Archive podcast. It's a show I describe variously as a way to see the world more clearly with a bit of quality world history and the podcast where the past is not dead. The past is not even past. Before I get into the main part of our show, which is really, I guess, about the crisis of story and of history making uh, in the current crisis of world events, the regrettable and sad and tragic wars that are breaking out around the world, and all the economic crises, and environmental crises, and social crises, and uh, and uh, cultural crises and political crises that all seem to pile upon each other. Uh, now, just a couple of quick updates from me. Do check out my Substack at jeffrich.substack.com. You can join my free weekly newsletter. You can also uh, upgrade your subscription and support my writing and get bonus content. In fact, bonus content just about every week uh, at the moment on Substack. And on Substack, I'm just about to commence a bit of a year in review series in my bonus content for. So if you are a paid subscriber, do look forward to that. And if you haven't subscribed yet, why don't you go to jeffrich.substack.com and join me there. And you'll find my thoughts on uh, how 2023 has played out now that we're in the last six or seven, eight weeks of the, uh, the year, how it's played out against seven big dimensions of this world crisis that I've been talking about a lot on the show this year. So the poly crisis is a term that Adam Tooze uses about this kind of sense of crisis in the world, both that everything's changing uh, all at once, but also that the way we made sense of the world on all those things that are changing all at once, they uh, they don't make sense anymore. So it's a, not only a crisis of change, but it's a crisis of meaning and understanding. Or if you like, it's also a crisis of story. The stories that we told ourselves about how the world works, um, how the world came to be the way it is history if you like those stories just don't make sense anymore and this story crisis i guess is always particularly acute when there is a war every war begins i guess with some kind of narrative myth truth they say is the first casualty of war and arguably history is both maybe one of the first uh, shooters in war as well as the 
one of the early casualties of War Two. The story of why the war began, or whether it was justified, what is the casus belli, the cause of the war, is always fundamental. And these stories often fight for our attention. Clearly, war is deeply tragic for all those people who are directly impacted by the the actual fighting and the the, the kinetics of it, but especially in the current global media, internet communications environment, war exists as this set of stories about what's going on as much as anything. The Russia and Ukraine war was experienced and identified with in different ways by people all around the world far, far, far from uh, eastern Ukraine. And the same thing clearly is happening today in uh, Gaza or in response to events in Gaza. Uh, Stories and the search for stories that make sense of the horror and the difficulty and the hopes and the tragedies of war drive the emotional difficulty of living in a time of war. And in a sense, I talked a little bit about that in the podcast last time. But there is a saying, an old saying, I think, yes, when giants or when elephants clash Ants die, it might be an Indian saying or an African saying, maybe, I'm not entirely sure. But today you could say elephants or giants are clashing and uh, the ants are as quickly as possible jumping on social media to tweet their opinions and change the flags in their bios. And in such a circumstance, there is a real crisis about stories and what stories to identify with and what stories to tell about uh, wars and how they came about. There's a crisis of story for not the direct participant, their soldiers and um, victims of the war, but for the citizens of both combatant and non-combatant countries. But similarly, uh, stories play a big role for the powerful in war and crises as well. In the same way, the story crisis of this sense that the world just doesn't make sense against our basic story of how it came to be and what it's meant to be like anymore, this story crisis also affects the powerful. And when dramatic and uh, challenging and shocking and uh, critical events occur, often key decision makers are trapped in very powerful stories about the past themselves. Uh, For example, Condoleezza Rice, who was the Secretary of State um, when uh, the, you know, the terrorist bombing in New York, 9-11, New York and Washington occurred in, in September 2001. And she instantly um, appraised the situation with reference to a historical comparison. Her comparison was, this was our generation's Pearl Harbor. It was a surprise attack on uh, America. And and that thinking and the and the sort of I guess almost the going back and playing the roles of the different uh, people from that time and trying to fast forward events in the same sort of way deeply affected some of the decisions that were made and arguably some people say affected those decisions in a bad way because it perhaps wasn't really uh, equivalent to Pearl Harbor. After all, Pearl Harbor did involve a uh, attack by another state, Japan. In fact, another you could say another imperial state, Japan, which at that point was occupying large parts of China. And there had been a rather long build-up to the event. But nonetheless, often crises use these histories as frameworks to make sense of rapidly developing events and to try to make sense in the moment when, you know, the buildings are falling and everything's collapsing and everyone is demanding some sort of sensible action right now. And we can see three examples in some of the current talk of 
the sort of war, the, you know, the various conflicts around the world, or even just general developments around the world, international affairs developments around the world are of such examples. Indeed, one of those is Pearl Harbor. Uh, when the attack on October 7th occurred the, uh, by Hamas against the uh, various civilians in Israel, then the, I think it was the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu directly said, this is our Pearl Harbor, it is our 9-11. He did exactly the same thing as uh, Condoleezza Rice did and evoked the same kind of pattern and scale and nature of response and in a way justified as extreme as possible a response to that attack. Similarly, there are many people who talk about the multipolar world and the unipolar world and how the world is changing now in ways that the the world, the architecture of world uh, global institutions and uh, international affairs is changing from the post-1945 world, an assumed set of uh, systems or assumed world order that uh, was put in place uh, in 1945 after World War II and has in principle endured ever, ever since. And there are variations on this story. You could say it's more the world that was put in place after 1991, after the collapse of the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, because the uh, the world before then, or the international system before then, uh, and after then, before and after the Cold War, is very different. But again, this involves various comparisons as well. So there were clearly a particular sequence of events that led to the establishment of the United Nations, the establishment of a set of institutions and of legal conventions and frameworks in 1945. There had been a war and a set of warring parties and a set of non-warring parties, um, and it all changed. And of course, between now and 1945, between 1945 and 1991, the world changed in pretty dramatic ways uh, as well. Decolonisation occurred in 1945. Britain still uh, hankered and believed that it could hold on to the British Empire within a year or two. It had lost India and it would lose nearly all of its dominions in the next couple of decades. And then a third example, which is in the context of the Gaza war, is put by, is a very interesting one. I don't entirely know the validity of it, but it's an interesting idea um, put by the former British diplomat, who's very interesting on the Israel-Gaza situation, or Israel-Palestine-Gaza Middle East situation. If you get a chance to listen to him, that's Alastair Crook, uh, C R O O K E, and uh, he has made a comparison between what's going on now with the various, uh, I guess, Muslim and Arab uh, states in the Middle East, North Africa, and going into Turkey uh, with a sort of pulling away from American influence in in reaction to what's been going on in Israel and America's strong support for what's been going on in Israel. He compares it to the Arab revolt in 1916 against the uh, centuries-old then Ottoman Empire, which ultimately led to the disintegration and breakup of the, the Ottoman Empire, its weakening, I guess, um, prior to the end of World War I and its collapse. Now, none of these are really, really labelled theories about things. They're not specific 
books. They're more ways of saying or memes or stories or myths that circulate and provide a way, a framework for understanding very, very complex events involving the whole world and uh, long stretches of time and very complex chains of causation and influence and conflict. Uh, There are ways of condensing it into something that we can cope with in our minds. And in a way, this pattern of thinking, it's no way of avoiding this pattern of thinking because uh, it's not like, well, there's a scientific way to make sense of all these events. All we need to do is look at the data, uh, run the equations and uh, we'll have the answer. Uh, These are incredibly complex events with so many uh, sophisticated things in which what's more people have active you know people have agency people can make their own decisions about things and the way of thinking about this is something that we just do as uh, as humans. We do this because narrative is how our minds make sense of the world, especially the world as it unfolds in time. And not only as it unfolds in time, but as it as it acts through people. Stories are about characters and time and the unpredictable chance weird things that people do and that's the kind of mind concept in a way that we need to make sense of history but what's more this is something that humans do it's actually one of the very uh, distinctive aspects of human cognition some people even say that humans are narrative animals the uh, English Scottish I think maybe philosopher psychiatrist Ian McGilchrist who wrote on the matter of things and the uh, the master and his emissary looks very strongly it has sort of developed this whole concept of the uh, a, a sophisticated version of the concept of the left and the right hand side of the brain and how, I guess, intuition and rationality uh, are different ways of perceiving the world and need to work holistically together and that intuition and narrative, in fact, are amongst the most skillful ways of actually balancing intuition and rationality feeling rationality holistic thinking it's it's a cognitive asset if you like so just the fact that we create these narratives about the past is not just propaganda it's not just lies it's not just made up stuff and that we should just get back to you know hard sciences to understand the world in fact narratives combine emotion and fact social and physical worlds and the flow of extraordinary infinite complexity in time. I talked about um, narratives and patterns of stories, seven basic plot in, in episode 31 of the podcast in December 2021. So nearly two years ago. Uh, seven Basic Plots versus A Thousand and One Nights of Stories. And I'll put a link in the podcast description for you to if you might want to listen to that podcast, add it to the playlist and I'll listen to it after this one. So the point is not to dismiss or to avoid telling stories when we're trying to make sense of comparing current events with past events. Just because someone makes a historical comparison or or relays a well-known story or you could almost say myth about the past doesn't mean they're wrong they could actually they're probably repeating those things because there's a powerful truth in those stories a powerful truth 
in the way of thinking about how these complex events relate to each other. But the whole world can't be described in one, perhaps not even in seven basic stories. So it's perhaps wise to look around for some variety in our stories. Um, And that's because stories can certainly bring insight, but they also bring distortion. They're not perfect. But what's more, we don't assess them like they're like a research paper or a scientific research project. We look at the stories about the past just as we do when we sort of look at our own personal biography. We look at those stories as to how can they make sense of our needs. When we look at a social situation and, you know, a conflict that's emerging between our friends, we look at the stories to try to not to establish the truth or or otherwise of various people's version of events so much as to make sense of how they're acting and then how we can orient ourselves to how they're acting. Our highest need isn't really to nurse grievance as I described last week, it's rather to nurture empathy and in doing so to allow us to respond skillfully, to adapt skillfully to inherently social situations and in a way history is a way of making sense of social situations how after all are we all going to live together in this big bad multipolar world now of course no single academic history will do that for us either there's no encyclopedia of the world's past that is the final Uh, reference point for everything. So when people use historical comparisons, uh, we can't necessarily rely on historians to sort out the problem for us or academic history to sort out the problem for us. We actually have to think about how we and other people in normal social situations are using stories to um, make sense of the past. I'd almost say we need to learn from stories more than from historians. After all, historians, as in professional academic historians, are no better or worse than other people in general in terms of detaching their minds from hypnotic ideas, uh, from getting carried away emotionally by a sense of grievance or a sense of panic or a sense of fear and they can as much as anyone be you a lot of historians out there have an axe to grind or a client to serve and a lot of them provide the 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 fuel for many of the grievances of the world certainly over time historians have perhaps fostered as much as anything nationalist viewpoints uh, on history or that certainly broken down over recent times but other other beliefs other ideologies etc have been served by historians as well so i guess what we're looking for isn't so much as a professional credential or a particular authoritative institution or person a professor We're looking rather for a general disposition towards uh, assessing the kind of historical comparisons that are used, a a kind of disposition about thinking about how the past is impacting on us today and what we should do about it. Indeed, in just this last few years of world crisis and war, historians have been among the some of the most passionate and distorted perceivers of events i think in my episode on uh, nurturing empathy in a time of war i read from the very distinguished uh, historian uh, in general 
commentator on affairs, Simon Sharma, uh, in terms of his uh, response to the events in Gaza, the the attack by Hamas uh, on October the 7th. Context me, no context. Uh, Don't give me any stories about, you know, whether or not uh, there's another side to the story, he said. And perhaps he... He has, he has, in to some degree, received a lot of criticism for that point of view. In the context of the Ukraine war, the um, highly accredited historian Sahi Ploki uh, has written a book, the Rush uh, on the Russo-Ukraine War, but he has written it very much from a very entrenched uh, Ukraine nationalist historiographical point of view, and one that has arguably contributed to the intensity of feeling uh, there. A historian who I've talked about uh, on the podcast, uh, Peter Frankopan, who wrote a very distinguished book about the history of the world's environment and climate, the earth transformed in the last year or so. Uh, He completely lost his head earlier in the year when uh, the sort of events around Yevgeny Prigozhin were occurring in Russia. He was expecting there to be a sort of a replay of uh, February uh, 1917, uh, almost instantly that Russia was going to see widespread military revolts. And he made a bit of a goose of himself. Now, to some degree, uh, history is as much affected by (laughs) who pays the piper as uh, anything. And there There is a vast, you know, uh, ambassadorial security industry around geopolitical strategic thinking. In America, you know, the Cold War left a huge industry of uh, academics committed to, you know, uh, East European studies, Soviet studies, and uh, who are deeply invested in in. Uh, you know, finding bad things about Russia. So there is absolutely, you know, to some degree, a sort of institutional biases here. But, and to some degree, uh, this is not surprising. Another historian, Priya Satya, um, who is, I think, of Indian Pakistani um, sort of heritage, but she works in America has written uh, 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 an excellent book, Time's Monster History, Conscience and the uh, and Britain's Empire, which shows the long, long, long involvement of historians in um, uh, justifying empire, perhaps the way in which um, uh, has been occurring in recent times. But that whole discussion is perhaps more for the other uh, another day the, the it, i guess it's just to illustrate that the, you can't just say well there's an historian commenting on these events therefore i will abdicate my responsibility to try to think clearly about this situation to that person historians can be as distorted in their thinking as anyone and as bad in assessing um, the future or current events as anyone. Rather, I think what we, anyone who wants to be an independent thinker in this world of uh, distressing current events needs to do is really to learn to recognise the bad stories, the ill-fitting stories, to get a sense for, well, I've seen this movie before and it wasn't that good the first time. And so if you want to think independently, if you, you really need to rely on yourself and rely on the stories of history. After all, all historians are doing is relaying those stories of history. Uh, so you kind of need to sort of find the truth in the stories rather than in the historians. The narrative minds, um, you know, uh, 
of historians are essentially um, the same set of cognitive capacities as yours. You can do it too. It's just a matter of practice and sensitivity. Uh, And I think the most important thing is to really pick out a bad plot in the way that you would with a bad movie or a crappy ad. Uh, A couple of years ago, there was, I think, an American um, academic who produced a series of courses talking about you know, uh, taking, it was about identifying bullshit. Um, and he had a whole series of, uh, a whole series of uh, strategies of um, logic, you know, uh, how data is presented and how arguments are presented uh, about picking bullshit in um, various sort of arguments that are presented in the public domain, in business, in organisations, all the, the rest of it. Common fallacies, common distortions, cogn- common biases, common just, uh, you know, trying it on. And in a way, you need to do a similar kind of thing, develop a bit of a, you know, a sense for uh, where things are off, with the stories of the past, you need to be able to have a good detector for the story or the histories, uh, the, 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 the stories that are really wrong. And there are some big red flags uh, around some stories at the moment. Um, when you hear political leaders or People in the media talking about world events being, you know, a a battle between lightness and darkness, between good and evil, between democracy and autocracy. Uh, You can probably sense that we're getting into a very uh, fairy tale sort of version of history. When you hear yet again people uh, say this is just like the events leading up to World War II or World War I, you might again think that perhaps people are uh, making a comparison out of habit rather than out of thought. And when you hear people say that uh, any conflict in uh, complicated human societies is unprovoked then you might also get the same sense of things so developing that that sense of uh where people are just telling you bad stories is i guess one of the key things and it's actually can just work with your uh, inherent narrative mind. It's what we do when we watch uh, a good movie, a good thriller TV show. We sort of try to work out who is really the person responsible for the crime. And then what I also recommend is this idea of mindful history which again is something I talk about in this way because it's in everyone's grasp. You don't need to have done a history degree. You don't need to have done a PhD in history. You don't need to have an you know, authorised position at a university in order to do this. It's more about mindful reflection on the situation and watching carefully just as like so when you practice mindful meditation i think it's described as the um, non-judgmental attention to the present moment it's a similar concept with what i call mindful history it's non-judgmental attention to the past and to the stories that we tell each other about the past and that we tell ourselves about the past perhaps most of all our stories about the past are part of the mind's chatter that you try to calm and still when 
um, you practice mindful meditation. And in a way, we need to do the same thing about some of the stories we tell of the past. Not get caught up and carried away with them, but in a way, ask some simple questions with a disposition of careful, mindful attention. What is the story And how else can we tell this story? If people are using comparisons, ask about those comparisons. So how is this compar how is the event we're looking at in the present and the event we're looking at in the past? How is the Gaza War in World War Two? How is uh, the attack of Hamas on October the seventh and the attack of Japan on Pearl Harbor and other places in uh, 1941 from memory Um, how are they alike and how are they different and try to see the unique pattern uh, in the events of today because after all that's what you're really concerned about and you keep your attention on these comparisons and not to say ah let's do what we did in 1941 or 42 it's rather let's do what makes sense to do today what would be skillful today In a way, that is the work of a lifetime, just as making sense of your own life uh, and freeing yourself of uh, successive crazy ideas or crazy identities or mistaken beliefs, bad habits, uh, psychological patterns, traumatic memories and crazy dreams. But It can begin today with the simplest of tasks, with the aim of strengthening your mindful attention to the past, you can expand your repertoire of stories about the past. If you have to, that's it, that's it. One of the best ways to be able to tell a good story from a bad story, a good historical comparison from a bad historical comparison, is something as simple as build up your kit bag of stories so you have more things to compare to. When a war breaks out, you say, oh, maybe this one is more like this other war or this war or this war or this war rather than like World War II. And that's something we can all do. And it doesn't necessarily mean becoming like an expert in world history. It's more about being open and sensitive and building up a, this, a, a genuine sense of just how how the past doesn't fit into a preconceived set of ideas, but it really can quite surprise you sometimes so let's read and watch um, better and broader and more various stories of the past and in a way that's what the burning archive tries to do right from the beginning that's really what i guess i've tried to do to say the past is not foreign place well perhaps it is a foreign place but a foreign place today is not as uh, remote and disconnected from us as perhaps lp hartley was thinking the past is a surprising place um, but also a wonderful place a, a source for discovery of many things about ourselves today but it's also important i think to really rework some big stories right now sort of big kind of foundational myths almost within our culture uh, and uh, these four big stories i think are part of the 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 crisis of story that i spoke about at the beginning because uh the just the dominant ideas that are very much there just are not working so much anymore and what i want to do i'll just briefly mention these um four big stories uh, because you know they could all probably pull last give me an entire episode of a podcast i'm not saying they're the only ones they're ones that 
um, there'll be others that matter to you, but there are four that I think are especially important to make sense of the, the big world events, what people often describe as geopolitics, but which is in a way world history. And the real sense we have that a more evenly balanced world is emerging at the moment, and the one no longer so dominated by the West, by America, the idea of the emergence of a multipolar world, however uh, limited that term is. So one of those ideas, the first of those ideas, is really the theme of war and peace and the idea that World War II is almost like the ancestral mythic war that defines the nature of war in our minds. It's the reason people go back to saying the attack on Gaza is our Pearl Harbor. There's some also saying, let's replay this story again. The second big story is the sort of what's the nature of historical time? Is it linear and does it progress or is it cyclical? And if it is cyclical, can you measure those cycles? And you see some of the dominant ideas that dominant stories and myths in ideas of progress and decline in ideas of end of empire and and in theories of collapse and you see these ideas also in ideas of uh, like people talk about the fourth turning or peter turchin has a whole set of theories of cycles of social collapse the third big concept is the kind of world of empires and the world of nations, the world of evil empires and the world of democratic nations. You could almost describe this as the Star Wars myth, evil dark empire forces versus the the liberation forces and this is especially important in sort of making sense of the post-1945 world the idea of the liberal rules-based order the united nations and it's one perhaps where our historical experience has started to break down the power of those initial stories that the insights provided by those initial stories have perhaps waned over time and now contribute more distortions. The historian John Darwin of uh, After Tamerlan fame describes the weirdness of the world of nations that is um, born after 1945 and is so discrepant from a millennia of previous human experience and is perhaps no longer quite the right way of understanding the world. And then the fourth and last is the sort of one or many civilizations, cultures, faiths, or I suppose even identities. The idea of Western civilization, the idea of, a, you know, our civilization is the best civilization, or the idea that the world is a splendid garden and we can find many, many different ways in which to cultivate it. And the idea of civilizations I discussed a bit in my uh, interviews with Felipe Fernandez Armesto, and I'll also link that in the description below if you want to listen to those uh, podcasts as well and this is an especially live issue in terms of world leaders own understanding of how events are proceeding Xi Jinping has a global civilizations initiative Vladimir Putin gave a major speech that looked at civilization states Narendra Modi uh, has more openly in uh, consistently adopted the use of the term Bharat for India and although it is actually in India's constitution India that is Bharat it also evokes the idea of Indian Hindi Indic civilization over thousands of years are, are we still on a path of globalization into one liberal rules-based order, one global culture, all found 
happily together on Netflix and the internet or are we in a world of many interacting and exchanging uh, civilizations, cultures, faiths and identities. So these four stories, I think, help us give us a bit of a more specific way of thinking about the reimagining of this polycrisis. Never a term that I've been terribly happy with. Um, But I do feel this idea of a crisis of story, a crisis of making sense of how this world came to be the way it is and how some of the foundational historical stories that we tell ourselves about uh, how this world came to be and how that shapes current events, they are being challenged by (laughs) current events and the the they just don't seem to have the same force and the same plausibility anymore and what's more when you look around in the world of the whole world of creative quality storytelling and about the past and of world history there are more and more people who are coming up with different and better accounts of some of these big big ideas so it would do well for us to use some of those things to expand our repertoire of stories so that we can tell the difference between a good history and a bad history and so that we can perhaps more intelligently and independently think about the novelty and the strangeness of what is really happening right now with a much richer understanding of the novelty and strangeness of the past. The fact that it never ever really quite fitted the standard model stories that we have of the past and perhaps finding some of those new ways of telling the stories of the past can help us understand the world a little bit better today. And I think uh, that is really going to be my focus for the podcast really through uh, next year. Uh, and I will have a bit more to say for on that in the next couple of episodes of the podcast. I also just wanted to say that I'm going to be uh, just over, well, November, December, January, I'm just going to be reducing the frequency of the podcast just a little bit, probably more doing something like a fortnightly schedule. I'm just about to do my very first government writer masterclass. And if you're interested in that, leave me a comment on one of the various social medias. But yeah, I, I've got a few things on at the moment and so I just want to uh, reduce the scale of that and also bring a bit of a clear focus of the podcast for next year. And I think it's going to be about this sort of sense of let's work together to expand our repertoire of stories of the past, looking specifically at those four big themes of war and peace, of empires and nations, of civilizations and cultures and of I guess linear or cyclical time and look at some of the best books that there are on history to do that and use it to make better sense of the world that is changing around us. Do not get caught up too much in the the evil passions of the moment or the distressing events of the time and to have a sensible, mindful approach to history. And I'm going to try to link that in to maybe some online courses that I will offer uh, in 2024 as well. So more of that in due course. Just some quick reminders. Do like and uh, share the podcast with others. Subscribe if you haven't. Tell your friends about it. I'd love to build the audience for the show. I think especially an episode like this one where it's kind of talking about an approach anyone can really adopt to thinking about history. And uh, subscribe to my substack at jeffrich.substack.com. 
If you like, you can also support me through being a paid subscriber to the Substack. Check out my YouTube channel, the Burning Archive YouTube channel. And also check out my uh, website, theburningarchive.com, where I've got links to all my books, articles, uh, the newsletter, my courses, and my other content. So uh, thanks for listening today. I hope this has been helpful for you. Uh, I hope it gives you some uh, ideas for how to get too distressed and not get too excited, um, but most of all to respond skillfully and flexibly to current events uh, by thinking about the stories that we tell about the past. Okay, so I will be back next time. Until then, everyone, please take care, stay sane, and remember what thou lovest well will not be reft from thee.